We're incredibly excited to have our keynote um, be David Cohen from IPG's Magna. David is a longtime friend um, and colleague, and, and we're incredibly, incredibly privileged to have him join us. So I want to welcome David up to the stage and uh, let him introduce himself. Thanks very much. Thanks. All right. All right. Um, so uh, thanks, Gabe, for uh, inviting me here. I know um, we've been flirting with this idea a couple couple times before, and I'm glad we made it happen uh, made it happen this time. So uh, yep, my name is David Cohen. I run uh, Magna, which, in case you guys are not aware of what Magna is, um, we are we have three lines of business. Um, the first one is probably what we're most known for, which is the intelligence business. So a guy named Bob Cohen, C-O-E-N, no relation to me, uh, started the intelligence business, the forecasting business, in 1950. Where is media spend today? Where do we see the puck going? Where is inflation? Uh, the you know Fact versus fiction in terms of the media landscape. We do that for 72 markets around the world. So that's uh, probably the, the magna of uh, yesteryear. For about 10 years, we have been aggregating our spend uh, across IPG on the investment side of the business. So we go to the market with one voice, we negotiate with all the, the big media companies, aggregating all of our uh, clients' investment. And then the third, uh, you might notice a theme, there's three I's. We like alliteration, investment, intelligence, and innovation. And that is focused on technology and data and programmatic and helping our clients navigate a very, very complex world that we're all uh, living in. So that's, that's Magna. Um, I'm going to start by saying something that's maybe not uh, outlandish. Maybe you'd agree with me. People, consumers, are moving far faster than brands and agencies. The change that we have in our business in, is unprecedented. I, I've been doing this for quite some time, and every year when I think we're going to take a breath and we're going to catch up, something else comes along. The new shiny object, the new shiny penny, the new thing that we need to be on top of. It's also pretty fair to say, I don't think I'm uh, ruffling any feathers yet, that our, which I might, our ecosystem faces challenges. Um, there is no doubt about the fact that there is friction in this ecosystem that we call uh, media, marketing, creative services. And that friction actually takes a couple of different forms. It's being driven by technology change. So the exponential growth in technology, the exponential growth of bandwidth, 5G in our pockets sooner rather than later, driving media consumption change, driving ad market change, and it's kind of a vicious cycle. So our ecosystem certainly faces challenges. On top of that, I, I promise this is not going to be all morose and no one's going to be all crying by the time it's done. I'm just going to get the bad stuff out of the way and we'll talk about some good stuff. On top of all that, we have the realities of dealing with day-to-day. -day. I was talking to some folks before this session and we were joking about, forget about the agency of the future, I'm worried about the, the agency of tomorrow. How are we working uh, on solving some of the challenges that we have day-to-day -day while knowing that we're just at the tip of the iceberg? What's happening over the next two, three, five years from now is not only job security for all of us, but it is a, a tremendous challenge for us to help clients and marketers navigate that chaos. So I landed on five things that we're going to talk about today in terms of creating the agency of the future. What are the five things that we need to be cognizant of? The first one, which I just touched upon, is understanding the context in which we operate. Analyze the marketplace context. So we're going to do that uh, in a second. That could be a three-hour presentation in and of itself. I'm just going to talk on a couple of highlights. Number two, understand the business economics. I call this the business of running the business. And in the agency world, uh, much like in other parts of the world, there has never been more pressure and more challenge on that uh, side of the business. Number three, Build trust and transparency. We talked about that just now on this panel uh, right before this. It's critical. It's never been more critical for us to have an open 
and honest relationship and dialogue with our clients and with our media partners. Uh, number four, leverage technology, data, and automation. Uh, I think that goes without saying. And number five, we're in a service business. And we always say it's a very trite and hackneyed thing to say that the most important thing we have is our people. But there is no doubt about that. As we go out and we pitch new business, uh, the thing that wins or loses is the people that are going to be working on that client's business. All the other stuff is noise. Everyone has data. Everyone has technology. Everyone has a process. We hear all the time from uh, search consultants you put one agency after the other, you strip out the logo, and everyone is saying exactly the same thing. So it's about whoever has the best people wins. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing at IPG Media Brands to, to develop that, to nurture that, to train that, uh, to invest in people beyond dollars and cents. The one thing that I didn't put on here is structure. What is the ideal structure? And I thought about it. There is no ideal structure. We, on the agency side, are a reflection of our clients. And we don't have the same client structure in every case. We still have clients, in some cases, where there's a separate, dedicated digital lead. We have other cases where it's an integrated offering. So we are a reflection of that. And I didn't think it would be particularly productive talking about all the particular permutations of what that could look like. So I'm not going to talk about structure. I'm going to start with a couple of headlines that we have all seen in the press. And I think it's probably fair to say that it's been fairly tumultuous out in Adland in terms of uh, people and companies and movement and acquisitions and mergers. Never been a more dynamic time in the business. This is just over, I think, the past six to 12 months. So let's start with some context, some marketplace context, of which that's number one. The first thing that we'll say is that the proliferation of devices in the home has exploded, doubled in the past 15 years, from 5.7 devices on average to double that in 2016. What does that mean? That means that we have far more challenge aggregating reach and aggregating audience. Not that I was around in, been around a long time, not that I was around in 1960 and 1970 in this business, but you could run three spots on television and reach 80% of the country. That's absolutely not the case today. So proliferation of devices, the number one issue that we need to deal with. I was asked a question in an interview pro right before this, is uh, television dead? I am fairly certain that television is not dead, but the consumption paradigm, the way that we consume television content, it maybe not, isn't dead, but it's certainly dying. And we look at, uh, this is the time of year where we, we start that kind of feeding frenzy around the television upfronts, which I enjoy very, very much, uh, and talking about how are ratings changing uh, over time. And for a long time, it was really about youth, young adults, 12 to 24, 18 to 24, that's what's changing. Well, the truth of the matter is, older adults, sadly of which I am in that cohort now, adults 25 to 54, are also changing. In fact, over the prior three years, changing more than younger adults. And if you look at the ratings decrease over four years, it's close to 40%. It's 30-something percent in terms of the typical way that we consume content. So is television dead? No. Is the paradigm by which or the manner in which we're consuming that content dead? Maybe not dead, but dying or changing. On top of that, we have folks that are making the choice to not pay $150 a month on an MVPD or a subscription to Fios or Comcast or someone else. So the cord cutters and cord nevers are ushering in this age of over-the-top consumption. And you can see um, year on year, it was, it's, not, it's material now. It's not that it's insignificant. And we see some partners like ESPN or the Weather Channel where the erosion of this audience is actually taking an impact or a bite out of their ratings performance. 
And we expect this will continue over time. We also look at how does this vary in terms of consumption vehicle. Let's take the top television broadcast partners. How does live, delayed, OTT, mobile viewing change over time? And you will see in every instance, live is going down. In some cases, it is much more significant than others. But the rise of OTT and the rise of mobile is absolutely here and present. So it's no longer just a little fantasy. It's no longer the sky is falling. This is absolutely happening, and it's real today. We do a uh, publication every so often at Magna uh, called the Media Economy Report. We did one on OTT, I want to say maybe six or eight months ago, where we looked at the landscape of OTT players, uh, platforms, producers, content distributors, um, and it really was beneficial to go out and talk to clients about you know, the fact versus fiction, hype versus reality in the OTT space. You might have seen um, a couple weeks ago, we just announced a partnership that we just um, penned with uh, Roku. Uh, one of the challenges in the OTT space, as I'm sure many of you know, is that some of them are not ad supported. Um, and I don't know about you, but I pay my mortgage on my ability to get ads in front of the right consumers uh, at the right time. So we are very, very interested in supporting platforms that um, allow us to uh, insert ads. Roku was one of those partners that is at scale in the OTT space um, and an ad-supported uh, player. So we're very, very excited about that. Cross-screen is probably the second most imperative thing for us to think about as we architect the agency of the future uh, today. How do we re-aggregate those audiences from mobile to OTT to linear television, et cetera? It's a really, really vexing problem. I'm going to talk a little bit later about some of the ways that we're trying to solve that. But I don't think it's an agency by agency solution. I think as an industry, we need to sort this out. So more to come on that uh, in a second. Total content ratings, I am not going to take a pot shot at Nielsen, although I could and many people do. So total content ratings, which uh, we all know has been fairly well maligned, supposed to come out in Q1, now pushed off to Q2. If I was a betting man, I might believe that it's going to be pushed off indefinitely. And we all know that this is not going to solve our challenge. This is a, a planning tool. This is a content tool. This is not a currency tool. I'm more interested in the conversations that we have is around total ad ratings. That's the focus that we should have. What do my ads deliver in terms of audience? Not necessarily content, not an aggregate of ads in a pod, my specific client ads. And that's, I think, what the focus is, uh, or what we should have today and in the future. I don't want to be totally um, dramatic be a drama queen, but I do believe that we have a currency crisis. I do believe that we're going to get into the upfront again, and I do believe that we're going to trade on Nielsen age sex demos by and large. We'll have a little side project where we have custom targets and we'll keep track of them, but the industry hasn't changed an awful lot in the past 50 or 60 years, and that's a, that's a darn shame, I think. So it's going to take some maybe unfriendly bedfellows to get together to figure this out. Maybe, and this is heresy perhaps, maybe it's Google and Facebook and NBCU and Viacom and Turner and Comscore and Nielsen, because I think if left to their own devices, it's going to be really challenging for the established uh, currency providers today to solve the challenge that we have in this space. That's the environment that we're operating in, in a, in a nutshell. Let's talk about um, the economics of running an agency business. And I will tell you that it has never been more difficult um, on the agency side to uh, be valued for what we do, to get paid for what we provide. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's definitely something that keeps uh, me up at night. Sometimes I feel like that little egg in the vice as things are getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed out of every piece 
of uh, the equation. I will tell you that um, who remembers the Standard Agency Commission back in the back in the day, right? Fifteen. Oh my lord, am I old? Fifteen percent Standard Agency Commission was the difference between gross and net. Today, as we listen to search consultants, as we pitch and win new business, the agency is generally viewed as something that has an effective commission rate of something more like 2 to 3%. So to give you a sense of what clients' expectations are for uh, that value extraction. On top of that, we have some battles that are going on between marketing and procurement. On the marketing side of the equation, we have folks that are interested in data and insights and custom audiences and the best ideas and the smartest thinking. And then on the other side of the equation, we have procurement departments. And this is not a knock on procurement departments. They are designed to extract value. That value is an agency buying media impressions, buying coffee beans, buying paper towels, buying toilet paper, it doesn't matter. They are looking to extract value and compare apples to apples. In today's day and age, apples to apples is really hard to figure out. On top of that, we have a fork in the road. We have an idea of commodity. Do we just buy a lot of cheap stuff, which sometimes is the case? Or do we do what's right for the business? Do we do something that's bespoke, something that's custom? It's very, very hard to win today in some of these very large new business pitches if we don't talk out of both sides of our mouth, if we don't play on the commodity side of the equation and play on the custom side of the equation. So that is a real challenge for us on the agency side of the business. The truth of the matter is, I always uh, give this analogy of the center of the plate. The center of the plate in our world are the brand agencies. UM Initiative are those examples uh, in the media brands world. And as I talked about before, um, media consultants, advertising consultants, agency consultants are expecting that that center of the plate is extracting a margin that's something like, or a, an effective commission rate of three to 5%, which is quite low. What ends up happening is the periphery around the center of the plate, the specialized services, search, mobile, social, content, programmatic, those are the areas. And I think, I guess I understand, it's a difference between a general practitioner and a brain surgeon, right? So a brain surgeon is obviously valued more for what they're able to do than a general practitioner. Th so that's the, that's the equation in the agency world today. It's balancing the, the center of the plate because we have to have really good, smart talent at UM and initiative and equally smart on the periphery with all of our specialized business units. Trust and transparency, we, I, we just heard about that um, on the panel right before this. Uh, I think that the ANA and the K2 report and the past year has been good uh, for the business in that it has surfaced a lot of conversations that we hadn't had in the past. We just assumed, and assuming is never a good idea. So I think at IPG, we, are, we have been very, very well positioned to have these conversations and have a industry-leading conversation with clients and prospective clients in the arena of trust and transparency. This is obviously something that is not going to be going away. If we think about, on the panel before they talked about, of every dollar, 17 cents actually ends up um, making its way to a consumer. There's a whole lot of value extraction that is not transparent and does not build trust. So we've gone on a road tour uh, of our clients over the past 12 months talking about this issue asking if there's anything that is concerning to them, asking them if there's anything that they have questions about. And we've had some really, really good substantive co uh, conversations. So my only guidance in terms of architecting the agency of the future is don't brush this under the rug because it just kind of fosters and builds 
and it breeds distrust. So very, very important. Let's talk a little bit about technology, data, and uh, automation. Uh, a recent study that I know I just saw um, cited that uh, CMOs, CMOs who have been marketing professionals for years and years and years, by and large, fully a third of them really don't understand this world of technology. They don't understand their programmatic approach. They just don't understand all the jargon that we have uh, in this space. Um, that's on top of the fact that they are given a broader mandate to understand and to guide their investment. So this is a really challenging area for clients and therefore for agencies. One of our other media economy reports we did was on the programmatic market. And while Gabe doesn't use the word programmatic, uh, we do. So it is uh, audience-based buying. It's the com confluence of technology and data and inventory. And I know this will shock you to say when you see that we're expecting explosive growth globally uh, over the next couple of years by 2020, uh, astronomic uh, growth uh, in this space. This is going to be exacerbated by a proliferation of mobile devices. So by 2020, from a few billion smartphones in our pockets to 10 billion uh, in the world, the world becomes terribly complicated terribly quickly. We talked about the measurement side of the equation a little bit uh, before. Several years ago, I'm probably not exactly right, maybe six, seven, eight years ago, we acknowledged that this proliferation of devices and technology, um, we need to do something about it. We need to be able to plan better. We need to be able to buy better. We need to be able to measure better. So we invested in a uh, data stack that we call uh, AMP, uh, audience measurement platform, and it is an aggregation of a whole host of different data sources built on an Experian spine, so Comscore, Nielsen, Rentrack, uh, clients' first-party data, to allow us to plan more effectively and measure that all the way through the equation. The one thing that drove me crazy is that we would develop all of these custom targets and then we would buy on adults 25 to 54. How ridiculous is that? So AMP allows us to follow from the insight uh, generation to measuring effectiveness far better uh, than ever before. On top of that, we looked at our business and all the inputs that we have from ad servers, total audience ratings, DCM, etc. And we realized that we needed some automation to figure out how do we extract from our system a better handle on what, we, what stimulus do we put in the market? Did we deliver what it is that we wanted to deliver? Did it perform as we wanted it to perform? So we have a platform that we have rolled out called Magnifique. You like that name? Magnifique. I didn't come up with that myself. But um, it, you could see some of the uh, inputs and some of the outputs, and we have greater visibility today than ever before in terms of understanding where money's being spent, did we get what we expected, did it perform as we anticipated, and it allows us to be far more dynamic in the marketplace. So if you go back to the first thing that I said, people are moving faster than brands and agencies, being able to be agile, being able to change on the fly, that is where winning happens. And Magnifique is uh, one way of us doing that. Another thing that we're doing is we are helping our clients along this process that we call 99 and 1. 99 and 1. So if you plot on a grid media and advertising uh, maturity and the ability, uh, the ability to aggregate an audience, you will see that there are uh, as you would imagine, a scattershot of opportunities, things that are newer to the market, things that are more scaled. And we, most of the time, play in the 90% bucket. We play in the area that is mostly safe. We're able to aggregate large audiences. It's fairly well established. We have a good sense of how much it should cost. And that's where the majority of uh, our time is spent. What we have tried very hard to do is get our internal constituents and our clients to focus on the 9% and the 1%. Do you remember those days where we had a dedicated 
innovation budget. I remember them. You would take uh, three to five percent of an overall budget and just try, test, explore, try things. It's okay if you fail. Today, there is little to no tolerance for failure. So we are trying very hard to bring back this idea of let's not just focus on the 90 percent. Let's focus on the nine and the one. Let's bring back this idea of planning for innovation. Test, learn, and deploy. The last thing I'm going to talk about in my remaining four minutes is talent. Arguably the most important thing that we have uh, at an agency. And that's about mix, diversity, culture, and development. Diversity and inclusion is something that a lot of people talk about. I will say that we are putting our money where our mouth is at IPG. We have an entire group of people that are focused on ensuring that we have a diverse workforce. We have a woman, Heidi Gardner, who, is, uh, who does nothing but make sure that diversity and inclusion is something um, that we are instituting at all of our agencies. And this is not because it's nice to do. This is because we believe it is a business strategic advantage if we have a diverse workforce. So we have done unconscious bias training. We have an ongoing survey, what we call um, annual climate for inclusion, to see how we're doing on that. We're able to measure ourselves over time, and we're KPI'd on our ability to drive that for the organization. Learning and development is another area um, that we spend a lot of time on. We have a framework here that is slightly different. It's a 70-20-10. It's our belief that 70% of what we learn is based on on-the-job training. 20% is based on social interactions with your peers and your colleagues. And the remaining 10% is based on formal in-classroom training. And we have a ongoing effort to uh, develop uh, learning and development. Leadership training. We have a program called the D30. Uh, which is to take 30 of our most um, up-and-coming rising stars in our global network. We had uh, the first one was in Berlin, the second one was in Vienna, and it's all about finding your personal leadership. I went to the one in Vienna. It was the most amazing and extraordinary week I have ever spent. And it's not about the business. It's not about the context. It's about you as a human being. What makes you tick? What makes you happy? What makes you energized? What makes you enthusiastic? So leadership training is obviously super duper important. Values and culture, super important. We have a culture that we're trying to instill a culture of gratitude and a culture of feedback. There, it's very, very difficult to give feedback to someone, especially if it's, cons if it's uh, constructive or critical. But it's always good to do that if, if you've given five pieces of positive feedback. And then you can give some critical or constructive feedback. So a culture of feedback is something that we are trying to uh, instill. Arguably the hardest part of our job is attracting talent. Certainly at the mid and junior level, there's a whole bunch of movement. And it's really, really hard to make sure that we are attracting the best and the brightest. Uh, at Media Brands, we hire for culture and we train for skill. Hire for culture, train for skill. Uh, and we just launched a new career portal. So if anyone's looking for a job, you could go take a look online. OK, last thing I'm going to talk about, and I'm uh, running out of time, so I'm going to breeze through this uh, quite quickly. What will the future look like? The future will look like um, from a few billion smartphones to a few hundred billion connected devices. And all of them won't have an interface, but most of them will be talking to us either giving us bits of information, other giving us bits of insight, or allowing us to do our jobs uh, smarter, faster, and more effective than ever before. We will have a multitude, a commoditization of content that we will need to use some search engine optimization, some search engine marketing tactics to find and discover what that looks like. We will have environments where brands like BMW and Coca-Cola are co-mingling with established brands like Hulu? And how do we think thinking about programming those brands in those environments? We will have a much more global conversation. Today we talk about the number of global media companies that truly operate globally. 
Not very many. I could count them on one hand. Netflix is a global player, and there will be more truly global players as time goes on, and that's obviously very, very exciting. Retail, being spurred on by Amazon, entirely will change the game in terms of from thought to purchase, frictionless. I will just tap that Tide uh, Dash thing on my washing machine, and all of a sudden it'll show up at my house. That's going to change the game. And then finally, VR and AR. We have debates all the time internally. Is this going to be the next best thing since sliced bread? Is this the next thing that we need to worry about? And I bet you, in some categories, in sports, in gaming, in real estate, in travel, it might be. But I wonder, is it going to be the next truly scaled mass platform? I'm not sure. But that's obviously something that we, we need to uh, think about. My final two slides will be the ones that I started with, which is just to reassert that agility is the key to success. We can't stay still. At Magna, we are trying to disrupt the market. We're trying to instigate. We're trying to not do the same thing year after year because it's easier. And I think the agency of the future uh, will do that as well. My favorite transition, which just having some fun with PowerPoint, sorry, is to just reiterate what are the five things that we need to think about as we are programming the agency of the future. We need to think about the marketplace context. We need to understand how we make money. We need to build trust and transparency. We need to leverage data, technology, and automation. And we need to win the talent war. Thank you very much.